You guys know me as Cove, and I started studying Klingon in 1988, and I've worked on a whole bunch of projects since then, including the Klingon dialogue for the television series Star Trek Discovery. It is my enormous honor to have the opportunity to uh, introduce and interview Mary Chifo. She played the Laurel, the Klingon who used her charm and cunning to uh, seize control of an entire empire on Discovery. Welcome, Mary. I'm going to be Klingon direct here and just go straight to questions on your involvement in Discovery. Could you tell us about um, how you, um, how the casting process went from when you first heard about the part to when you discovered you'd been cast? Uh, first of all, yes, just Katlo. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to uh, speak um, with you, uh, especially since we've had such a long, wonderful relationship with the Klingon text and of course the Klingon Language Institute overall, which made it all possible for me to be able to talk about talk, speaking in Klingon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, with the casting process, I have like the short, medium and long version of it. So I'm gonna go with the short one because we have so many great questions to get to. Uh, but essentially, um, I, I like to say that I was cast uh, because of my, uh, uh, my calling card was, I had just graduated from Juilliard uh, with a lot of uh, language uh, training and a lot of physical training and CBS casting had seen our showcase at the, at the end of our fourth year, we have a showcase. Um, and so they were aware of me, I had met with them. And then this was about a year or so afterwards, um, I, and the story with Laurel is that initially the kind of uh, position that she has in the first two episodes was more or less what I was definitely going to do. Uh, and the rest of the plot kind of unfolded as the series progressed and they knew they needed someone to come up with this idea with Vogue and everything like that. So I essentially was cast because I was six feet tall, had a square jaw, um, had a facility with language and physical training. Uh, so I didn't have an overt um uh casting process in like coming in and auditioning and speaking in Klingon or not Ken Mitchell has much more elaborate like coming in sort of speaking Klingon stories uh so that's uh that's just, that's the kind of general origin story and um yeah I mean it all kind of I, I was cast in August of 2016 that's when I got like the official thing that was like you are playing a Klingon <laughs> and it all just kind of snowballed from there. So at what point did you learn that you were going to have extensive dialogue in Klingon? Um, I love this question because it made me go, when did I? Uh, I think it was kind of, again, like I think that was a huge part of like the pitch of having me play the part was uh, they were looking for actors who would have a facility with language uh, and uh, so I had a sense, I didn't know how extensive until I think we just started getting scripts. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I, I just remember that was part of like, do you think you can do prosthetics? Do you think you can do language? You can do, and I, of course, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's essentially, at least my recollection was, it was just once we started getting the scripts and as you know, uh, that was when we met and then I just dove in head first and I was lucky that my first very Klingon heavy episode for me specifically wasn't until that fourth episode. So I got to kind of ease into it. <laughs> so before Discovery, were you familiar with Star Trek? Yes, I, I was definitely, I was familiar with it. I've become a full-fledged fan now, uh, but I ha had actually been introduced through the, the reboot of movie. The 2009 film was like the first time I just saw um, a full story of Star Trek. But then because of that, um, I was so excited. I always, I grew up with a lot of uh, fantasy and sci-fi and just loving genre in general. Uh, and so of course, when I, was seeing this movie advertised like, oh, I'm gonna like that. Uh, and then I did. And then my dad was like, let's watch some of the original films. And so, because I loved those characters, he's like, let's, let's look back at, you know, the OG, the OG, T O G. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, from there, then I always say that I, when I was cast in Discovery, that period of time between 
getting cast in August and then beginning rehearsals in January, that's when I hunkered down and watched every Klingon centric episode uh, in in canon. Or I would not even Klingon centric any episode that featured a Klingon because they have on the Wikia page just if a Klingon pops up in an episode, it's on the list. And so I watched all of those. And so I got it was a I of course wanted to watch every episode ever but I was like you don't have that much time right now Mary um so I still got a lot because there are so many wonderful Klingon episodes and but just got to be familiar with each different um cast and series a little bit more and I got super into Deep Space Nine that's the one I ended up watching a little bit more than just Klingon episodes for but there are a lot of Klingon episodes there obviously that was where a lot of the culture uh was fleshed out and developed um but yeah, yeah, now I just am grateful all, you know, my dear friend, Dr. Erin McDonald uh, has on her Twitch channel, she and her friend, Samantha, have been watching through all the various Trek episodes and every once in a while, they'll invite me to come and watch the six episodes they're watching to discuss. So I'll sometimes rewatch ones I've seen or, or be introduced to new ones. Um, so I'm just kind of in the perpetual process of, of being exposed to more track but i do i do love it and uh it's so wonderful obviously with conventions and instances like this i i love getting recommendations from people about what's your favorite episode and all that sort of stuff that's great uh, when i first met you uh in toronto you came to your your briefing on the klingon languages and to, to meet the coaches and you blew me away because you walked in carrying a copy of the klingon dictionary that was already battered and highlighted and marked up and bookmarked can you tell me where the copy came from and what it was like you know studying klingon on your own or what happened there yes and in fact i have it right here <laughs> I like I went into my little my my uh, Star Trek box. I have a few little storage boxes. It's 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 literally in pieces. Uh, and yeah, as you said, the little highlights and uh, all these sorts of um, and I also have so basically so the origin story is that again, when I get nervous or or whatever, I prepare. And uh, so I was cast but had no script, didn't have much to work with except for Klingon, Star Trek, you know, basically that. <laughs> and so uh, I was watching the Klingon centric episodes. I went online, I Googled just like Klingon books and just ordered and got all of the ones I could get my hands on. This was one of them. And it was somebody else's. Um, it was, I got it, you know, on, on the Amazon or something like that. And uh, so it, it has been owned by someone else. So that was part of the beating up. But what I did, again, to pass the time was read through it. And then I have here, let's see. Yeah, you can see example. I copied by hand the entire book into my notebook uh, just because I needed something to do. I wanted to just start getting used to writing out the language. And But yeah, it's like, this is just, this is just all of the, each section um so there i'm so glad that you asked that question because it made me be like let me find that let me prove to myself that i worked really hard on this <laughs> um but yeah so it was a great you know obviously i knew i wasn't going to be able to be fluent by january <laughs> but i wanted to just have that familiarity with the text and you know i got the recordings you know the um you know, uh, that, that, that they were from from the 90s, the various with Worf and Balana doing all that. So it's just getting, and I know that there's a lot of different opinions about the various pronunciations there, but uh, I just, you know, again, was, was reaching for whatever I possibly could uh, in that regard. So I could just have as much familiarity for when I did meet you uh, that we weren't starting from zero, that at least um, I had a sense of that vocabulary. Uh, of course, it was such a gift to then meet you and with Rhea and Jeffrey to be able to um, have someone really tell me what to do. Uh, <laughs> and so, so you read the dictionary through and you obviously found the prefix table as it just automatically broke open at that point. So yeah. do all of ours. Yeah. <laughs> you try to construct sentences? Um, yeah, I mean, I def I wrote down for sure, like it, it was fun, the, the different examples and stuff, breaking them down. Um, I, I don't think I outright, uh, I, well, I'm trying to think back. It's so interesting because it has been 
you know, a while. It's it's interesting to have these questions and me, you know, it's what been, well, if that was 2016, like, yeah, four, five years almost um, since this whole process started. Um, I know there were a few times where, well, yeah, I actually, I remember, because we did get the script um, at one point, got some Klingon translations, but hadn't had the recordings yet. Because I think what we, and you can speak to this as well, I remember we ended up figuring out, oh, this is what's helpful. And I'm sure we'll speak to it more later on, like, oh, if you do these recordings and stuff. But I remember initially getting um, the text and not having the awesome back translations that we ended up using. Uh, so I do remember trying to parse it together myself. I was like, okay, well, that's that word and that's that. And you know what they have in the back of the book of words. So I remember trying to um, put things together. And I think too, cause I was on Twitter. This is all literally coming back to me in the moment, but um, being on, on Twitter and wanting to try and respond or like construct the sentence. Uh, but of course being also very nervous because I didn't want to do it improperly. So I think I, I played around a little bit, but for the most part, as you know, I often often defer to Robin <laughs> once I once I uh, got to meet you. Everyone here has the same memories of looking at those things, trying to figure out what it meant, trying to string stuff together and not wanting to get it wrong. It's like you're yeah. you're, you're you're really among allies here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so once you did get uh, and I'll maybe post an example of it, um, a you know, the the line from the script, the oh, Klingon yeah. translation the back translation and a recording um, did, uh, you didn't get that directly from me. I sent it to Rhea and she gave it to you and then you did some process. Can you um, tell me the mystery between that and it coming out of your, of your mouth in front of the camera? Yes, absolutely. I know, I was trying to think, I might have it. I, li I just had the, I have the box here of like my old scripts. So I'm like, where's, where's one? But, um, but yes, the back translations, Let's see. If I can't find it right away, then I'm just gonna. I have a lot of, lot of stuff in here. Um, let's see. Where is it? Anyway, I'll just explain it. <laughs> but basically, yeah, with the back translations, which I personally really, it really helped me. Like I said, I come from. Uh, also, I just realized I didn't say that I'm wearing my shirt. <laughs> that's what's that's what's happening. Um, but yes, uh, with the back translations. The way I work, I really liken the, my process to how I would work with Shakespeare text in school. Um, obviously with Shakespeare, there are a few more words that I would recognize in English, but definitely the mentality of um, breaking down, like looking up, making sure you know the meaning of each word you're saying and like memorizing the meaning as opposed to just the sound. Um, that's just how it's going to stick with me. And I knew that coming in and Rianne and I discovered that pretty early on. And again, thanks to you recording, recording the, uh, the various lengths of, of, of the sounds. And then once we really got into the rhythm, um, certainly we found by the second season, I had a, you know, I can, I'm not fluent as we know, but the reading and writing of being pretty familiar with the, um, with the uh, symbols and the sound correlation. Um, but to the back translations, to my process, um, we would get, yeah, you would do this awesome word for word uh, translation. And my general process was, um, I get that, I'd look it over, I'd, you know, go through, listen to the recordings that you would make um, of the sounds, familiarizing myself, I would repeat it back. Um, and again, uh, you would do, I know you know this, but <laughs> for everyone, would do this slow, medium, and then regular speed. So could really get my mouth around the sounds and get familiar with that. Um, but then when it came to actually working with Rhea, um, usually with episodes, um, I was back and forth between LA and Toronto a lot. So usually uh, on, a good, on a, uh, a good episode, as in like uh, getting the script ahead of time, like for the fourth episode, which I'm so grateful, my first big episode, I had about, I think like two and a half, three weeks before we filmed because I wasn't in the third episode because that's when they introduced all of the main Discovery cast. So we were, you know, there were no Klingons in that episode. Well, there was, there was a Shushin Klingon, but <laughs> there wasn't a, as much Klingon in, in that episode. So I was back in LA and we got the script pretty much right after um, 
uh, I mean, yeah, we just had time. And uh, so from that process, I had, I think about two uh, uh, FaceTime sessions with Rhea um, while I was still in LA, like one near the beginning, I had been somewhat familiar and then we went through it. And the way we would go through it um, would be, I liked, I don't remember exactly when we found this was the rhythm, but I think it was around there because we had been able to work together a little bit in those first two episodes. I just didn't have uh, as many lines. So we had a sense of our vocabulary and how we worked, uh, but that was the episode where we're like, okay, this is how, this is how we're going to make it really happen. And I like to go sentence by sentence because the syntax is so different. Um, so I like, I would just, you know, I would say the back translation English. So not, not the translation that was often on screen uh, or what the writers usually wrote. And that's something to know, as you know, you would get the English script and the, the, the writers would just write the scenes, scenes in English and then go, hey, translate it. And as you know, and as I came to learn, oftentimes the Klingon translation is much prettier. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of times where, yeah, I'd be looking at the translation um, in English and being like, oh, just doesn't serve it. Just doesn't serve the, the eloquence of what, what we said. Um, but uh, so that for me, again, I wanted to memorize meaning as well as learn inflection, which harkens back to what I was saying about applying my Shakespearean training, which was that like a huge part of that is by identifying the words and understanding what's the operative word, what's the, you know, what's the verb noun relationship, like what is propelling this um, conversation forward. Um, oftentimes with Shakespeare, because it's obviously in a rhythm that's slightly different from uh, modern English, you have to kind of decipher for yourself, oh, the, these are the words I want to hit. This word actually doesn't mean what I think it does. It means this other same thing. So I really have to hit the meaning along with, um, along with the sound. And also relating it to Shakespeare, which again, as we know, you haven't heard Shakespeare, you've heard it in the original Klingon. Um, but the way in which uh, it's a very visceral, uh, obviously we know Klingon is a very visceral language, um, but with Shakespeare, a huge part of my training um, uh, emphasis was let the consonants, let the vowels inform your feeling. And uh, I had a, a teacher who, uh, as an exercise, he would give us soliloquies that, you know, most of us hadn't read or worked on at least. Maybe we had heard it once, but hadn't, you know, do, you know, gone in and looked up all the words yet. And he would just have us go through and just really hit the vowel consonant action, depending on, like, one example is at the end of Lear, howl, 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 that whole speech is extremely open vowel heavy because it's, it's, a, it's an expression of mourning and grief and, you know, just, uh, he is completely, um, or as I did in, in the, um, my second year, a female version of King Lear, because that's what you do, obviously. Um, me ascending into Lorella's mother was really no surprise once it happened. I was like, oh, yes, this has been coming. But I remember working on that, that speech specifically and talking about how, yes, it's howl, but it's really the ah, like it is how that sound is informing your feeling. And then there's like the opposite of that. There's certain soliloquies and speeches that are very, very sharp consonant heavy where someone's really, um, uh, you know, if someone's cursing like Margaret in Richard III, a lot of her um, speeches are very, you know, sharp and uh, filled with uh, consonant action. So that, I love that. And again, I'm a very, um, uh, I'm a very kinesthetic and um, I guess <laughs> a verbal learner. And uh, so for me, that was my key end. So just applying that to the Klingon, which is interesting because I don't know, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but the way we were both embracing what had come before and how we'd heard Klingon on screen, then mixing that with how Klingon has been spoken, well, like within this community, um, finding the flow of that without taking away the actual appropriate pronunciation, which was an interesting challenge and trying not to over uh, <laughs> um, Americanize, I would say, or, or federationize uh, the flow. Like that's always the balance because it is a different language. It is like, if you were looking at French or any language, the culture is impacted by um, 
the by the language by the cadence of the language and so i didn't want to try and over humanize humanize oh, i guess that's oh, there's a there's a slight reverb um humanize uh, <laughs> um the way i was expressing like i wanted to let the sounds in the same way i let the vowels and consonant in inform me when i was doing a shakespeare speech inform how the character carried herself and how she had a different relationship with communication because of culture. Um, but this is me, I, I told you, I, get, I go all sorts of places, but in the process, that was essentially like, in, on a very practical level, what Rhea and I would do was, yeah, going word for word, um, English then Klingon, English then Klingon, and she would read the other lines. So I was also memorizing um, the other, I wasn't as overtly memorizing, like I wasn't gonna, I knew I wasn't gonna have to say the other person's line, but I was really memorizing what they were saying and what my response was. Cause if anything, whether it, Engl it be English or Klingon, it's very important in my opinion to know your, uh, your scene partner's line almost more than yours. Cause you have to know what you're responding to. Um, but that was really, and I would record those sessions so that I was able to then go back over them and just kind of play it. I would take walks, I would listen to it um you know and then once i got to toronto i would have in-person session sessions with ria and closer to the, the actual day of filming you know i'd hunker down and i was very lucky too that um ken and shazad in particular my main klingon uh speaking buddies um we uh we really enjoy each other's company and we would just go over you know either they'd come to my hotel room or we'd go to shazad's or whatever it was and we would um we would run the scenes in English, then in Klingon back and forth and just kind of play. So when we got on set, um, there, then we had the factor of prosthetics and armor and all these other flames, so many flames. <laughs> I know that Klingons love flames, but sometimes it's like, can we just find a different way to do the flames? It just gets very hot under the prosthetic, but we knew that there were gonna be so many other distractions on the day. So if we had a real sense of the flow of the emotionality of the scene, and again, what is, what is happening in this scene? Like, is this, you know, am I convincing you of something? Like really just going back to basics of scene study of like, what do you want? What are you going after? So we had done all of that homework. And again, it, so much of this lean, le or leaned or catered to theater training, which I was so glad I had. Like so many of those skills that it's easy to be like, oh, in, in film and TV, like, it's it's a different thing. It is a different thing, but I think you can utilize those skills um, from from that background. And in this case, in particular, not only was it the rehearsal comfortability with rehearsal and practice, but then on the day being so heightened, that was also just a very theatrical thing. Like getting to do the speeches I did, you just don't get to do that on most TV shows. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for all of that. And after having to learn all the, the, the Klingon stuff in Klingon, they then opened it up and let you speak English. Yes. Which uh, was a bit of a relief for some of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us how you developed your Klingon accent in English? Yes. In fact, I have more evidence of that somewhere here. Okay, so like I said, coming from the theater training that I had, um, Yes, the, the, it was that fifth episode where I was torturing Lorca. That was my first time speaking English. And uh, I knew, again, I'd done, my goal as an actor always is there's only so much power I have. If I'm only being hired as an actor, there I create opportunities for myself where I'm producing, directing, doing the other stuff. But when my sole purpose is to be the actor, the best I can do is do as much research as possible and, uh, you know, come up with my own interpretation and my whole goal with watching those Klingon centric episodes was not just to be able to say I did it but to be able to look at the way the Klingons carried themselves in different series and notice what their dialect is and as we know like in the um in TNG and Deep Space Nine and, and Voyager like and you know we we see it is a Shakespearean sort of elevated, but there isn't an overt dialect that's like universal, except for it has a bit of this Shakespearean quality. And you see that in the movies, you just see it overall in TOS as well. Um, but knowing that Discovery was 10 years prior um, and knowing that we were really leaning towards the conversations we were having from the get-go. And I think you were there in some of those rooms when we were talking about looking at 
the the reverence towards Klingon culture that, and specifically that House de Kuvma was this kind of ancient reverence uh, for the Klingons and the purity of the Klingons. So in my mind, listening to the Klingon, the, the, the Klingon accent is in like when speaking Klingon, what those sounds are like, how they live in our bodies. And again, that was, I'm a very kinesthetic person, like feeling how those different sounds lived within me. I knew that the dialect I wanted it to be very specific. I also, I wanted to be able to answer a question like this and let y'all know that it wasn't like, oh, I think I'm just gonna make it sound like some sort of mixture of like Russian and Irish, which was something that people seem to think. So my Klingon dialect sheet that I created, this is, uh, it basically based off of like when I did in school, I did dancing at uh, Lunasa, uh, the in Northern Ireland. So when I did that, I got a dialect sheet much like this with all the different sound changes. Um, and uh, so what I did based off of the Klingon dictionary was that in that, you know, that, that book, um, I mean, in that book, in the, the page with all of the different, uh, different sounds where it's like Psalm, uh, you know, ah as in Psalm, not as in ah. Um, so what I leaned towards was all of those particular sounds, any sound that wasn't ah with an A, um, I adjusted to lean towards the psalm sound because there's one general pronunciation for each vowel. I knew that there were gonna be some words where I would have to lean a little bit more towards an English because the audience just needed to understand it. Would you do kind of, I did that in Lunasa as well when I was doing um, Irish accent because sometimes you just need uh, uh, clarity. But um, like one example, um, I'm trying to think, I, I'm, but I just went through all the different, uh, well, I guess this is a pretty, the, like ah, like we said, ah as in, like that's the IPA symbol because I leaned on like trap, bad, uh, hat, I noted modify, cling on ah, hint, uh, which is IPA, ah, the ah symbol. Um, and so like with after, these are all the lines that I had to say in that first scene with Lorca. After, like in English, I would go after agonizing and back captain. So I leaned a little bit more towards um, well, cap Captain was one of the ones I love, Captain Lorca. So instead of saying Captain Lorca, I just wanted it to have a little bit more of that, ah, uh, Captain, Captain Lorca. And then, so so I would do that vowel by vowel. Um, and then when it came to consonant action, and like, see here, I, I show the vowels that do not change because those are the vowels, th th those sounds are the sounds that we're used to saying. Um, and, and then, yeah, with the consonants, uh, like for example, um, the, like for K, key, clock, school or something, so for stop plosives, as we said, I would say leans towards uvular, pharyngeal, uh, Klingon, lowercase Q or capital Q, very guttural and raspy, raspy and strongly articulated. So I wouldn't, overly hit it, but I would, especially with those certain consonants that had, um, you know, sister sounds in the Klingon language and particularly more aggressive moments, like when would I hit the in certain H's and things like that. So again, I set this up so that I could play around. Um, and what I kept finding as well was our kind of storytelling wise, Lorel, as we know, is a very observant, smart, Klingon, and uh, as she became more familiar with English speakers, um, because in my mind, she had learned English, she was extremely um, eloquent and fluent in it, um, but had not spoken to actual humans using it. So, you know, who knows what, what sort of, you know, training program they had for learning English. But in my mind, it was like, she was really hearing it come from humans' mouths for the first time as, uh, in real time as we watched her on the show. And so, and then obviously as she becomes chancellor and is just, you know, diplomatic, like 
she's learned more cadences. She's able to like modify her way of speaking um, to fit what the humans need. Um, and so uh, at, at this point, certainly too, I wanted to be able to trust the flow um, that my instincts of what her dialect is um, kind of just exist within me. And uh, that's been really fun to reach that point where I did all of that homework so that now um, if I do have to embody her voice, it's, uh, it, it drops in pretty quickly. That's very insightful that um, the vowels are what's going on because that seems to be something that's harder to change in an accent. Um, yeah. Was, um, when you actually did have to speak Klingon, was there a word or a sound that you found particularly challenging? Um, well, yes, I wanted to also ask you because I know you had to listen and watch all the Klingon uh, scenes and you know just make sure that we were good, uh, good enough. <laughs> Um, so I was curious, I feel like there were certain things that I usually had to correct. I feel like to me, it's like just making sure there's the distinct clarification between, you know, the GH and the capital H. Um, that was, yeah, you're not the like, whole room full of people that are nodding. It's a yeah. very common thing to have to learn. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah. And it's, and then once you do hit it, like you feel that difference for sure. I was thinking about like, um, like that you get that right there you get that juxtaposition pretty closely and like it does um kind of help each other but um yeah i would say and then i w also the ea or the e, e which is something that i struggle with um in english because i'm <laughs> i have a weird mixture of being from uh the valley in la and also my mom's southern so the e, e differentiation is has never been a strong suit of mine. <laughs> you know, I'll say get get instead of get, and um, so that's just a overall. If I'm working on heightened text, and I'm you know if I'm doing a Shakespeare that's like doing it in a standard American, like really trying to have it be that sort of um, sound, or like with Klingon, I know because I know if I don't if I hit it incorrectly, um, it's a different meaning. So that was just another kind of merry overall thing that I always am checking. I'm like, did you do the eh, eh? <laughs> um, And I did find that um, sometimes just flowing through, certainly near the beginning, getting familiar with the sounds, I would go through um, uh, just the vowels, just the consonants, like just to practice. So you get that sort of yeah, oh, ah, eh, ah, eh, ah, you know, <laughs> so I'm like, getting used to those sounds in my mouth and that flow. And then I would go with the, with the consonants as well. Uh, that was just a little like technique that I learned in school to just work on pronunciation and stuff. I know that if you made a, a pronunciation error that was grievous enough that I tagged it and it went up the chain, they said, yes, you know, she should re-record it. You um, had to go and do AD ADR. Um, it says very additional dialogue recording. Can you describe what that's like from the actor's point of view? Yeah, it's very interesting. And I had a very unique experience in that regard because usually it is indeed ADR, which is the additional dialogue. Um, you know, they'll, they'll look at the episode cut and then they go, oh wait, we didn't make it clear that she blah, blah, blah. Um, so let's add in a line. And as you know, then they'll cut to the back of someone else's head and add in or back of my head and see the reaction to a new line. Um, so there's that, but then what I also did was a lot of dubbing, which is, uh, partly because in the first season, there was just a lot in the prosthetic that muffled sound, uh, with the mic. And so what they realized was they needed me to come back in for, I would say at least 90% of my dialogue in that first season, I went back and recorded in the booth, um, just so that they had a cleaner, uh, cleaner uh, version of it, which as a perfectionist and who is very, um, um, what's the, uh, sonic, I guess, uh, 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 um, sound sensitive, I guess I would say. Um, it was kind of great to see, oh, they cut that line in the scene. Cause I tend to, again, like with cadences and meaning, um, if I know this other line's coming up, I might lift the end of my, my line. Cause I know I'm gonna wham it down with that next one. And then sometimes they cut that second line so then you, I like, and no one's going to notice this except me, but it will be like, blah, 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 blah. And then it's on the other thing. And I'm like, ah, so then I was able to go back and, and kind of 
redo it the way I would now that I knew that the scene was going to be what it was. But specifically to the Klingon, yes, there would be, it was a mixture of moments. Either it would be that producers wanted to change the line or something like that. Or you would note, hey, actually, by doing that instead of a, uh, it's, it means something you don't want it to mean. So then just going back uh, into the booth and it's great. They have um, some great uh, uh, sounds uh, booths set up. Like I, it's very fun going to the Warner Brothers lot was often where we would go and uh, I'd have my little headphones and uh, they have the, the clip of the scene. They'll, if it was a scene I hadn't seen yet, I would often ask if I could see the full context of it. Cause some people just come in and they're like, yeah, just tell me what to say. But I wanted to know what, you know, I wanted to remember the meaning. And um, so they were often very lovely and uh, let me see the full scene for context. And then they kind of count you in for that particular line. And then you say it until it's right. <laughs> and it is that kind of com um, uh, confluence of, of meaning and sound. So making sure that it still has the essence of what that moment was, but also hitting the consonant or the vowel in the appropriate way. Um, and yeah, again, like I had a lot of time in the booth that first season, um, I had not mainly because they just needed it to be more clean. Um, and it was actually kind of jarring in the second season. There was a lot that they, that like in the, that third, big third episode, I only had to come in and fix a few different Klingon things. And there were like full scenes. They're like, yeah, no, you're good to go. And I was like, what do you mean? I was so used to being able to like read up all my lives. I was like, okay. Thanks guys. Ah! Um, but it was all was well, all was well. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting process and something that um, I also, again, because my ear is for better or for worse, very sensitive. Um, when I'm watching other shows, um, I like to play the game of like, you can kind of like, it's usually mixed quite well, but every once in a while you can tell either because of the angle, like you're like, oh, it's on somebody else. And this line feels a little bit like, expositional because we need it in this moment so it's like very fun for me knowing that that's something that's done um watching different shows and being like oh I bet they added that later or like they needed to you know put that line in there um which is fun but it's a, yeah it's a very cool process and Rhea would be there um to push the language stuff in particular um which was which was nice as well I know some people sometimes assume that you are fluent in Klingon, thanks to the uh, the emotion and the fluency that you deliver your lines with. Um, have you already um, experience with uh, either fans or directors assuming that you could um, extemporize in Klingon? I've definitely I uh, I was thinking in regards to like uh, actually being on set or work related. I feel there is a certain level of, and I remember Rhea saying this once, we had one particular episode, the the eighth episode of the first season where we just didn't get the, the uh, script uh, until like a week before. And even then it wasn't a week before. You might've recalled this, I think. Uh, and, but we pulled it out, you know, we figured like, we just, you know, we asked for a few cards for backup, but we pretty much had it memorized by the Friday that we had to record it. It was the two pretty big Klingon scenes between me and Ken. And, uh, but we made it work and we figured it out. And that's kind of the whole thing with the industry is like, there's that kind of like, and now we've done it. Thank goodness we did it because we're professionals. But now we're like, but now it's like, it seems like, oh yeah, we can pull it out. Like we can, we can learn Klingon that quickly, which again is true, but it's always preferable to have at least <laughs> a week out to prep it. Um, so there have been instances like that. There have been a few moments where, and Robin, you've, you've been on the other end of this where someone's like, hey, can you do this thing? And I'm like, can I check in with my Klingon translator? <laughs> for like, but like, can I just make sure? And I am obviously, I'm very sensitive to the pronunciation. I always wanna make sure, I know that it's easy to get, um, not to get lazy, but for me to just be like, yeah, yeah, well, I can read and write it pretty well. And I do, I can identify, like I know the distinctions, but it's always good. If I know it's something that's gonna be recorded for posterity, I want to make sure that I've checked with you and and heard your thoughts on it. So there have been a few instances where I'm like, one second, <laughs> I d I'm not that fluent. Um, but I haven't had, I'm trying to think, I think I just make it very clear very early on that I'm like, yes, yes, no, I'm not fluent fluent, but, but yeah. We like to maintain the fiction. 
But yeah. now you put yourself out there and you said that um, you can pronounce it based on what it's written. So I sent you a Klingon phrase yeah. and I did not send you my uh, trademark slower, even slower, normal speed. Yeah. And um, let's hear what it sounds like. All right. I got my water. <clears throat> okay. Jich dun lau, hot Klingon dun push. Majka. <laughs> I'm sure everybody understood that you just said you were the greatest Klingon of all. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> what I can say, I just read what I just read what was there. I just read what was there. <laughs> it is so written. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are beloved to fandom, not just because of your portrayal of Laurel, but for your beautiful embrace of the diversity of fandom. I wonder if you'd like to speak about your personal activism and what role you think that a public person can play that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate this question because I, I am very grateful and like humbled every day that the, my first real big job in this industry is a part of a franchise that is always championed um, IDIC, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And I think with that, there's a recognition of the fact that we still have so much further to go, um, but it's so important that we have these cornerstones of our culture that have created stories um, that are a mirror and not just a mirror universe, but a, a mirror of uh, what our society is and is both inspirational and aspirational for where we're headed as a culture. And uh, for me personally, I've always been headstrong. I've always been like, I was calling myself a feminist in like elementary school. Uh, and uh, I just was like, this sounds that. like I heard what it was. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's me. Uh, go women. Um, so I've always been, again, just, and very lucky that I grew up in an environment where I was very celebrated um, both by my parents and my peers for the most part for, for being passionate, for being smart. Um, I had a fair amount of role models in the storytelling that I was reading and watching um, that made me think, oh, being, being smart and, and powerful as a woman is great. Um, so I very early on knew that one of my largest goals as an artist, because it became clear to me, like middle school onward, that I really did love performing and that acting was the thing I wanted to put my heart and soul into. So I wanted to make sure as someone who cares about the world and humanity as a whole, that the art I was creating was somehow, you know, reflecting um, that passion and was creating uh, creating characters and, and embodying characters if they had already been written um, and putting my own feminist spin on them and just, you know, investigating. I know we've always seen this character this way, but what happens if we turn it on its head? And I got to really, um, double down on that in college. Uh, as I said, uh, they, at Juilliard, they cast me as Queen Lear. And then I got to play a female version of Macbeth and lots of other characters, but I was always being pushed to embody my full self, which again, I, I'm so grateful for because it allowed me to be that for Laurel. Um, so, and I, I've spoken to this many times on various panels and stuff, but the there are parallels between me and Laurel in coming into her own and into her leadership I mean, it, it's really wild, truly her ascension from the shadows to the spotlight uh, very much reflected my own journey and the journey I'm still on um, when it comes to vocalizing what I believe in. And again, anyone who follows me on social media knows that I, I like to be bold and supportive of things. Um, and yeah, I mean, to the question of like, what is an actor's job? What is an artist's job? I think there's a myriad of opinions and I fall in a lot of different places depending on what it is. But um, I respect people who wanna just be like, I'm putting it on the screen, I'm putting it on the stage. I'm not gonna be vocal about it on social media or in person, I'm not gonna do protests or whatever it is. And there's a validity in that if you feel that the art that you're creating is a version of that sort of confrontation and comfort. I mean, I think art serves both. And I think we've seen that a lot in this past year um, was such a challenging moment in history, um, how art has both been an escape and also a very important uh, way to elicit change um, and reflection. 
And then, yeah, for me personally, it's a mixture because I have been obviously very vocal a lot. I haven't been as much on social media lately. I tend to be now on Twitter. I'm trying to more just retweet uh, others, uh, amplify other people's voices for the most part. Um, and then I, yeah, I just, I think there's so many different things to talk about. There's so uh, for better or for worse, there's so many different things that need to be discussed and need to be elevated and progress still needs to be made. Um, so for me, it's about finding out what I'm passionate about, whether it be something that directly relates to me and my experience, or, you know, I think all things ultimately do. That's the beauty of empathy is that you realize, oh, we are, we all have, um, a universal experience and it's important for us to understand the differences between those experiences in order to come together as a stronger whole. Um, but yeah, I'm in an interesting place. Like I, it's, it's nice to have this question come up because I do feel grateful that the platform that I am on because of Trek has allowed me to feel empowered there, to vocalize my, my true opinions and my true self. Uh, but I think there's a lot of my true self that I'm still finding. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm eager to explore as the years go on. And I definitely have had a lot of time to reflect <laughs> in this past year um, about who I am and what I stand for. So I'm really eager um, in the years to come about how I continue to step into myself even more and champion even more people. Um, and again, the gift of conventions and just being a part of this community is that I've come to, to witness so many more people and so many different people and so many different, um, you know, life experiences. Uh, and so that's empowered me as well to just uh, celebrate that more and, and understand that uh, representation matters in every, and, and what Sonequa says representation creates actualization. And what that representation means is not necessarily just oh, we're looking at someone on screen and they look like me. That is huge and extremely important. And as someone who has struggled to see herself exactly on screen, um, and, and while I still, there's like um, so many aspects of myself that I have been able to see on screen. And I know that for a lot of people, they don't even have the amount of role models that I got to see on screen in the same way. I mean, we all kind of transmute what we need on the characters that are out there. And we've seen that with Trek throughout time, but um, I really am empowered to champion representation behind the scenes because I think the more we have our storytellers and our, again, our producers, our showrunners, our, like the, the higher ranking um, individuals who do get the final say, the more that we can truly um, expand who those people are, uh, the more we're going to get just different perspectives. Because to me, the celebration of inclusion and diversity is 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 not checking a box it's about getting other perspectives um and i want other perspectives i, I want to see someone else's interpretation of a story i've heard a million times uh because shakespeare was the first one to say or not the first one but definitely one to say there are only 14 stories anyway so how do we just keep saying well what is it what does it change to have this person in the protagonist seat what does it mean to have this character this this maybe villainous character but what does it mean to have this you know combination of um, identities there. So I just, again, IDIC, there's just infinite possibilities. And I hope that we just keep moving towards exploring those more and more. Are you familiar with the uh, term headcanon? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an audience question about um, your um, headcanon, what's not shown on screen, but what you think that um, goes on in Klingon society with respect to queerness and transness. Mm. That's a great question. Um, well, as the chancellor, <laughs> I would really like to uh, to believe, and I definitely feel it's true with the Klingon communities um, that I've witnessed around the globe, uh, that uh, who I've been lucky to meet, it is extremely inclusive. Um, and um, I'd like to believe that, yeah, my headcanon says that it's, I mean, admittedly, Laurel obviously struggled with some patriarchal stuff uh, as chancellor. So I do think the Klingon empire has some room to grow, but I'd like to believe that at least my headcanon says that under Laurel's rule uh, that she uh, understood that the embracing of, of all, all, um, all life was the most important way to be. 
Um, and I certainly think she would have that perspective from the struggle she had. Cause I, I did feel that that was a huge part of her arc. Like I said earlier was coming from the shadows into the spotlight because for me, it was that her society hadn't allowed her to fully see that she had that potential. So I'd like to imagine that in the years after, you know, um, once she sa helps save all sentient life in the galaxy, uh, what she's up to in those next uh, years is trying to create a more uh, inclusive environment. Um, so absolutely, I think that that uh, the <laughs> Kling Kling Klingons Klingons embrace all queerness, <laughs> as does Mary Chifo. <laughs> We were um, obviously delighted to see such a, a great Klingon uh, rise to the head of the empire and for that to give you this platform. Um, I wondered, um, many Star Trek actors report having had the talk when they joined Star Trek. Um, did anybody um, speak to you about um, the, the special um, intensity and longevity of Star Trek fandom? And did that adequately prepare you for becoming a shosh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think nothing ever fully prepares you until you have the experience. Um, but I certainly was surrounded by um, people who were very excited uh, for me. I did one specific uh, fun anecdote is that my dad actually, he also went to Juilliard uh, for drama. And um, he was in class with a lot of great actors, but Casey Biggs, um, Damar in Deep Space Nine uh, was in his class. And so uh, when I was cast, I remember he like reached out to my dad or like, I can't remember exactly, but he was like, oh yeah, Mary's gonna. And uh, we met up at that uh, SDLV that year. Uh, and he kind of was just like, it's great. And, you know, embrace it. And, um, and uh, so I had that great interaction, obviously, like, we had the great experience in the first season of having uh, Frakes direct that 10th episode, which I luckily had such a great scene uh, in that I got to work with him. And he of course was extremely celebratory of our whole cast and um, very, you know, encouraging. And I felt very like seen and respected by him. And of course he's like, you know, the, the greatest and was just like, oh yeah, it's gonna be great. You're gonna have a great time kid. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would just say once I started doing conventions, once I was meeting people, um, certainly on the actor side, like in the green room or whatever, everyone's just super lovely and like welcome. And then of course I got such a lovely reception when I was first cast. Yeah, again, on Twitter and online and I've continued that um, relationship there, but it's always been a real um, welcome. And then of course, like, I think there's the pressure of that and, um, but I found that what was great was the Discovery cast in particular during that first season. It's a group of people that really are passionate and want to do their best and, and celebrate the franchise. No one was above it, you know, whatever that means being, you know, I don't know. I just, some actors just want to like show up on set and then leave. And truly no one was that way in that first season. Um, and so I was really grateful that it was a universal sort of decision. And it wasn't an over, you know, like we didn't talk about it, but it was just like, oh, we're all this way. We're just gonna embrace this and celebrate it. So it was just this really kind of like holding hands, plunging in, obviously led by Sonequa, who is so incredible at um, including everyone uh, as much as possible, both like in having dinners and just when we're on set and everything. and. We didn't interact that much on screen until the very last episode in that first season and yet I always felt her presence and her support. Um, so yeah, it was just really this amazing group effort of like, here we are, we're doing the thing, let's let's make it happen. Was there a divide between the Federation characters or the actors playing Federation characters and the actors playing Klingon characters? So no, no genuine animosity, of course, um, but the, the joke, and I know Ken has the story, like one day, he visited the Federation set, like they were working on that. And I definitely had that experience as well, where everyone was like joking around and like, you know, like laughing between takes and like singing and dancing. And I mean, you know, you know, it was a certain day where it was like a lot of people on set and obviously they take it seriously. But when you're not covered in prosthetics and in heavy armor and in a low lit flame filled sarcophagus <laughs> ship, 
you're just going to be a little bit more buoyant. Um, and, you know, for us too, when we were, particularly at the beginning, we did have a lot of Klingon lines. We had to, we were like just kind of drilling them. Uh, then between takes also just staying cool. We had our cooling packs and we had our fans. We had, you know, just any way that we could survive. That was the general Klingon way, which again, I felt was very appropriate for the culture that we were in this state of, you know, honor and survival and be chomp. Um, but yes, the, Kling the Federation side of things definitely seemed a lot more uh, um, jovial on a regular basis, um, but we were able to laugh about that uh, a lot. And there were times where Federation peeps would come and visit. I remember one time in particular, Anthony and his partner, Ken, fiance, Ken, and uh, at the time uh, they were not yet engaged, but uh, they visited the last day that the, of the fourth episode, Shazad and I were doing that dilithium processor scene, which is one of my favorites. Um, the sexy, sexy, flirty, fun stuff. Um, and I remember that was very fun that we were working on it and then kind of came off when they were, you know, changing lenses or something like that. And, and they were both on the side like, oh yeah, this is so cool. Cause it is, you forget, but to see someone fully covered in armor and, and that type of makeup, and we're both like, Shadon and I are both like six feet, six, you know, like this is big people in these big armor suits. And it's like, it is like seeing an alien. So as much as we had to be a little bit more comatose, uh, it was fun when other humans would come by and uh, get to be like, wow, that's, that's insane. <laughs> I remember when a script first came across a desk that actually had Michael Burnham speaking Klingon and all of a sudden oh, yes. Samiqua had to do Klingon. Do you remember that? Yes. I remember. And she actually, speaking of ADR, I remember she sent a video uh, to, to, I think me and Ken and Shazad when she was just of her doing it. She's like, this is hard. You know, she was like, oh my God, how do you guys do this? It's amazing. And of course she did it brilliantly, but it was, uh, it was, it was a very fun moment. Uh, uh, both on both sides. That's good. That dilithium scene. If, if I needed to show somebody how powerful Klingon could be, that's the one that I would show. Do you have any other favorite moments? That's great. I, that definitely, I mean, is right up there. It's maybe my favorite with the with full Klingon dialogue. I will always still like the the season two mother speech. I I still can't believe I got to do that. <laughs> um, even though that wasn't as as much in Klingon, but just the way it was shot, my outfit, like it was just so Shakespearean and Greek, and and ending with that iconic line, like I'll just treasure that for always. Um, but with, when it comes to speaking the language, um, I'm trying to think what were some of my other. I mean, all of that. That I mean, dilithium processor scene for sure. Um, the scene where I'm convincing him to go over to the Shenzhou too was a great scene. And that was the scene that really cracked open their relationship for all of us. Like we knew in the script and you saw that there was nothing overt, overt in that script saying like, and they're in love, but there was definitely possibility. And Shazad and I kind of leaned that direction. And then Tunde, our director was kind of like, yeah, that seems good. And he's like, make it a little more flirty. And it was that scene we had, um, it was one of the first scenes that we'd filmed um, and I had my Klingon lady fingers, as I say, the first two episodes, I had these very big, they weren't mine. They, they hadn't made me specific ones. They were like these big Klingon man hands. And I had to wear like scuba gloves underneath for them to fit. It was a whole thing. I really just didn't have much dexterity, but then I got these new hands. And so I was like really excited to use them. And our, our armor was a little, um, more flexible at that point. So, uh, overall, I was just a little bit more, hey, hey. Uh, so that was the moment doing that scene was what allowed me to then I, I talk about that night actually we did that scene and then we did the scene where um, I betray Vogue um, in order to save him and uh, I was getting really torn up emotionally about it and then when I got home I really I took like a hot shower you know getting out all the cookie sweat and then I really cried because I was like oh well number one I knew it wasn't gonna work out for Laurel, like romantically. Like I think I was like, oh, this is like we already knew she's I was gonna end up, you know. So and I was like, okay, no way. Even if it ends like on a decent note, I'm still not gonna end up with this guy. <laughs> and uh, so I was kind of like, I I knew that oh, this is such an exciting choice because it it anchors me in emotionally, but also for the character. Oh, how, how poor Laurel. 
Um, so that that whole episode is just very special to me because it was when I found the character in it and it was an empowering moment as an artist because in hindsight, it was like, oh, we did that. That it was in the script, but like it was our, it is a collaborative art form and it was our energy and our willingness to go to this new place that was then accepted by Toon Day and accepted by the producers. And like, then they ended up writing so much in that regard. Um, less Klingon heavy, but I, I was talking about that scene that Frakes directed the, um, in Despite Yourself, um, where I do do the Klingon prayer to try and uh, bring Voke out. Uh, that is definitely one of my favorite scenes as well. I mean, it's intense and scary and, and particularly when you don't know the full context is not uh, one you just watch, watch casually. Um, but that was an exciting one, I think too, because of the memory of working on it with Frakes because he's such a actor's director and he was really getting us like, yeah, go, go, go. He's like at the monitor and like, say the Klingon again and do the thing. So um, I definitely, I, I treasure that um that moment as well i guess you never got directors giving you line readings in klingon <laughs> no yeah oh well, i would always joke some of the the notes i would get were so like if you got it as a human you'd be like oh, i hope so they'd be like you just seem so alive or like i can you, your emotions are clear i was like i hope so <laughs> you know <laughs> um but actually to that that dial uh dilithium processor scene that was definitely a moment where because it was the last scene we filmed and also yeah again that other the scene at the very end when I do come back for him and he's grabbing me and stuff like all of those scenes were just so visceral and powerful and we'd been able to work on them uh, but the the crew was like with us you know they had been with us for like two two and a half weeks I guess of filming and we all knew that that was the last scene of Laurel and Vogue together probably ever and even though they didn't understand the language outright, they could feel what was happening. And that was a really awesome moment and feeling to be like, oh, we're all here. We all get it, even though we don't know what every word, or they don't know what every word means. They get what's happening with the words. I heard that there was one director who was uncomfortable with the syncopation of Klingon, the fact that you're saying, you know, shosh, ah, eh, vile, eh. Mm -hmm. and and tried to get you to smooth it out and make it into italian or something is yeah, that true I, I i i i'm i don't outright remember that i feel like the overall i don't know of one specific director i know that the goal as you know was to create more of that fluidity um i don't i don't overtly remember that note for me but i'm like but i don't there wasn't another, I like, if Klingon stuff was happening, I was probably there. So <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think, and I mean, like you can speak to this as well, but I felt like the cadence I ended up finding for Laurel did have a certain flow. Like it's interesting, I was gonna bring up that I found we all ended up creating our own dialects, whether, you know, I did the whole sheet, but like based off of our experiences, like I, had been more exposed to romantic languages, to Spanish and to French. And uh, Shazad um, had grown up a more, more around Arabic and um, Ken is Canadian. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I guess some French there too. Uh, but again, like embodying characters, like we all found different kind of rhythms within the language that was character-based and also you know, actor based. Um, so uh, I, I tend to like, yeah, and answer, it's like not fully answering your question, but I, I, I found that it was like making sure that flow was there, but then still having to hit those sounds. Um, but I don't, I don't remember that, ex that exact experience. Although I, I do remember Toon Day being very eager in that fourth episode as well to just create the nuance like you were saying like let the scenes be intimate i think that's more of what i remember was that it was less about how it was being inflected but just how much we were embodying the moment like not letting the aggressive sounds that are innately part of the language um stifle us as english speakers because in our minds oh you then you're like being mean or whatever and instead just being like no that's just that's the sound and you do hear that in a lot of languages uh globally um, that 
you know, sounds that may sound aggressive to an English speaker are actually completely in the flow of, of the thought. I know you, you, you manage that quite ably. Um, Thanks. So if this were a regular convention um, in person and instead of being the annual meeting of the Klingon Language Institute, which um, is almost an academic con um, construct, if um, we could, you know, at a, at a real convention, we could go and, and buy a ticket somewhere and then stand in line to um, uh, get an, an eight by 10 glossy and have you sign it. I did some online research and saw that, um, you know, I, I would certainly stand in that line and I bet everybody would. Um, there's an address for an LA talent agency where apparently we could uh, rate for an autograph. Is there like a fee or a charitable donation that we give to do that? And is that correct? Yes, that, yeah, that is correct that, yeah, you, um, my, my agents can forward that to me. I would say specifying that you were from the Klingon Language Institute, because uh, sometimes it's, a, it's always a little tricky because there are unfortunately people that take advantage of, of um, people giving signatures, like they'll copy it and then sell it for their own means, which if, uh, if I'm at a convention and I'm getting paid to sign something, like I'll, I'll do it, like, and you can do with it whatever you want. Um, but I have to be a little bit, have a little more discretion if I'm getting something in the mail, because I don't know if I send it off, it might be used, uh, again, uh, like if I'm going to do a send, sign something for free, I want to make sure that it's because someone's really going to enjoy it personally. Um, so if, if you are so inclined, uh, to, to want a photo, just to indicate that you, you know about this through the Klingon Language Institute, because I'm so grateful, uh, for all that y'all have done um for the language so it's, it would be my pleasure to be able to sign and uh yeah certainly don't have to pay me anything but if you wanted to donate um there's so many great uh, causes out there i'm glad the the question of um whether the klingon empire supported the queer community uh which it does and i certainly do i would say the trevor project is a really um excellent place to support you know it's a 24-hour hotline um that is it's just a great space for anyone who's struggling or needs to talk. Um, and uh, so that's that's one of the first places that came to my mind. Um, if you're following me on Twitter, I'm usually posting about various other places, um, but I just really have um, a lot of uh, faith in what Trevor Project is doing. So that's just uh, a main place. If you're so inclined, you, you don't have to do it in my name. I just, I offer that for anyone who's looking for a good place to support. Um, but is that, would we have to track down a photo and send you that photo? Was your agent have, how does that work? Yeah, I would say I don't, it is, again, it's all <laughs> tricky, but like when it comes to conventions, uh, that's kind of just like a separate thing that like I have the photos that I bring for people to sign or it comes through the convention. Uh, so in this instance, yes, I would just encourage to to send whatever um, uh, photo is out there if you have something. But I don't I don't overtly have those available uh, uh, for for people. But I guess that that is to again, if you're if you're so inclined to write um, and let me know that that's that's something you'd be interested in uh, me signing again, if you indicate that it's from the Klingon Language Institute. Um, I'd be happy to um, sign, a, sign a photo and, and send that off. Well, thank so, you very much. I'll get Jen Bum to put that address up for people. Um, you. Do you have any new Klingon projects on the horizon? Uh, well, as we know, I was lucky enough to bring Voice to Laurel for Star Trek Online um, this year, which ultimately was such a gift during this uh, <laughs> pandemic. Uh, it was doable. To, to get in a booth and record for a few hours. Um, there's a little bit more coming your way in that regard uh, that Robin may or may not be privy to. <laughs> uh, there's some stuff in, in relation to that in, in August. Um, and so I mean, I'm very grateful for that whole team. They've been so um, supportive. Al Rivera in particular uh, is just such a great representative of, of that group and has you know, there's so much respect for the Klingons and for Laurel. Um, and uh, so I'm grateful to keep uh, playing with them uh, and bringing voice to Laurel with them. Um, but other than that, I genuinely wish there was more that I could even wink about. Uh, but that's the, that's it. outside of some fun stuff in August in relation to Star Trek Online. Um, 
I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still crossing my fingers and toes that some creative is going to be inspired to create that Klingon Game of Thrones we all want or whatever it is. Uh, so I, you know, they, they know where to find me. And uh, this community is so strong that I, I hope that um, eventually at the right moment, we'll be able to tell some more Klingon stories, uh, hopefully maybe in a, a more expanded way. Like the most common uh, question slash comment I'm seeing in the chat is everybody's just extreme gratitude and appreciation for your um, portrayal of Laurel and your embrace of the fan community. And they are interested in far more than just discovery. People want to know um, more about your enjoyment of fantasy and, and, and um, <laughs> stories and movies in general. What do you like? Oh, great. I love that. I can talk about that. Um, so yeah, so I grew up with, a, again, a lot of magic and fantasy, a lot of Greek myths, which again, it all tracks. Uh, for a while, I watched The Wizard of Oz every day. I was like, when I was like uh, three, we were, I was, my mom was working in Nebraska. And uh, funnily enough, and that was like right at the point that I was obsessed with uh, Wizard of Oz. And so I was like in a landscape that was similar to Kansas. And then, um, I uh, was obsessed with that. So, and then I had became obsessed with Wicked when that came out, of course, because Elphaba was a character that I finally felt I could really relate to. That was one of the first role models I really had as a character um, that felt the closest to me. There were a few in the past where I was like, oh, I wish I was that cool. And that was the one where I was like, yeah, I get it. Um, but I grew up, uh, Chronicles of Narnia was really big uh, for me, uh, both in reading the books, uh, a lot of these, like, re reading them out loud with my parents and then reading them on my own. I watched the the BBC movies of Narnia. And then of course, when the newer films came out as well, I was very enraptured with Harry Potter, which I currently feel very uh, 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 not great about. I mean, I, there it's a very complicated issue in regards to J.K. Rowling and, um, but as, for, for the most part, I really, um, don't want to support uh, what what she has vocalized. I, I mean, I definitely don't. Um, so it's hard for me now to articulate that Harry Potter made such a huge impact on me uh, and Hermione Granger did because that's true. She was one of those characters that really made me um, want to study and be, in, be smart. And because Hermione saves the day in pretty much every book. Um, and so I'm so grateful I had that influence, um, but I certainly feel that it's important that we acknowledge that we there's there's a lot to talk about about separation between creator and content. Um, so while I acknowledge and celebrate that that series made me believe in magic and made me start to create um, movies with my best friend Eve, who is still one of my best friends, um, we would create all of these stories. Um, with our little camcorder, like starting third, fourth grade, um, where it was like these two sisters who had British accents and they found out they had magical powers. Uh, so for me, it's like, I wanna lean more on celebrating the fact that those books opened a world of creativity for me. Um, and again, empowered me to be a smart, independent um, girl who asked for extra homework. Um, but I also, whenever I bring it up, I wanna acknowledge that I think um, that, 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 yeah, <laughs> I do not. I do not agree with um, J.K. Rowling's sentiments um, overall. Uh, outside of that, things that excite me now, things that I love. Um, I really the one series that I've like watched from start to finish. That's not. It is genre, but not a uh, fantasy or sci-fi. Is actually Jane the Virgin, which is a, a great CW show that's very stylized. Pushing Daisies was one of my favorite shows ever as well. I really love saturated color, heightened worlds, worlds that are aware of themselves, but also grounded in emotion. Like, I think it's such an interesting and fun task as an actor, certainly, or to watch actors be completely immersed in a world. I mean, we see this in genre stuff all the time, but uh, that, um, that you can have this very heightened world, but still experience real human emotion. And uh, so that was a series that I really um, uh, enjoyed lately. Um, 
what are I've been getting better at watching things. I'm I'm I tend to feel like I can't sit down and concentrate on something, so I don't watch it at all. Um, so I'm trying to discipline myself more. I'm watching more things. I watched a very sweet show on Freeform called Everything's Gonna Be Okay, which is not genre really at all, just a very kind of like human life thing, which I do tend to gravitate towards more heightened things. So that was fun to just watch something a little bit different. Um, I'm trying to think of, of a movie that I've seen recently that I've really, <laughs> my mind's a blank. Um, fantasy stuff, what other things? I'm trying to look at my bookshelf and see <laughs> what other things. I just started listening to Circe, the book, uh, that's kind of the origin story of Circe, um, written a few years ago uh, from, from the Greek mythology. Uh, so that's been a fun one to crack open. Um, what else? I'm trying, I'm like, I know I've watched some movies. I do, um, I like, um, well, yeah, again, like uh, Nine Before Christmas or uh, Edward Scissorhands, uh, definitely stories that center around a character who does not fit in, but has a lot to offer. Um, and my argument is that I wanna see more of those characters as women for me, not just because I want to play them, but I do, but like, I want to see that female Edward Scissorhands because that's the character I relate to in that movie. And I even had that with, I know to even dare we speak of Star Wars, um, but I had a very, very strong connection with Kylo Ren actually, which is a whole thing to unpack. Uh, not right now, um, but uh, to me, it's like that type of character. I, I love gray characters as I call them, the ones that are kind of not fully in the dark or the light. And obviously Star Wars is a very binary world. And I found, I was, I gravitated towards the character that was, to me, felt the most in tumult with that binary. Um, and so uh, I just would love to see more of those types of characters um, allowed to be women. And I do think Laurel got to live in that space a lot because she was not overtly a villain and yet did, was not a perfect <laughs> individual but it was mainly based on her culture and her perception and what she thought was the right thing to do based off of what she'd grown up around. So I love exploring characters that, that again, live, live in many worlds. And I found with Tyler Wren that because he had some darkness in him, he felt he had to be completely on the dark side. And I, I like that potential of that recognition of, oh no, that's not the case, that we all have darkness and light within us. And every decision we make is um, in the moment, you know, that we, you don't make, you're not an innately evil person, you're not an innately good person, that um, there's, there's room for exploration there. So um, those are certainly the types of characters that I love. And, and I really do hope um, to play more like them. And I do, again, on a, as a gendered issue, I do think when we, when we create more villainous female characters, um, they tend to live less in the gray. Uh, I also, I, well, oh, that's Studio Ghibli, Hayao Miyazaki. That is my universal, like my go-to, that's like the merch I get. Cause I know I'll never not love those movies. I get, I have my phone case, like is, is all the characters from Ghibli. Uh, I have like three different Ghibli bags. I have like a no face bag and like one with Totoro's on it. Um, but I think that in his more dystopian stories, like uh, Princess Mononoke and Nausicaa at the Valley of the Wind, um, he has these great female gray characters in both of those films that are not the protagonists, which are great as well, great female protagonists. But um, I wanna see more of those types of characters kind of, you know, in our, uh, I think we can, we can learn a lot from his nuanced gray storytelling overall, because I think his, his uh, premise is usually uh, ultimately that uh, humans are pretty awful, but we're also not the worst. <laughs> or like that we're doing a lot of terrible things, but there is some hope there, uh, which is kind of how I feel on a regular basis is that um, we're, I do believe in humanity. I just also believe we must recognize our flaws and where we have room to grow um, and where we can, 
be better at respecting one another and respecting the environment and respecting animals. Um, because innately, I think it's just cyclical. You can, if you're not respecting one of those things, you're innately not respecting any of them because we coexist together, which again is very Trekkian theme. There's a great question here that I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to let you wrap up with anything else you'd like to say. Okay. But the question is, is there any brief work of Shakespeare, a sonnet, a soliloquy, a monologue that you would love to see in Klingon? And be careful here, because when you say it, this is the KLI, it'll happen. <laughs> um, you know, I'd love to see, yeah, some Macbeth, one of the Macbeth soliloquies. I feel like Macbeth lends itself really well to a lot of Klingon stuff. Um, the, uh, my favorite, um, my, well, I'm trying, uh, my favorite Macbeth monologue again, because I, I, or soliloquy, I was lucky enough to work on the whole role, um, is, uh, um, I know I can't remember the, the, the first line, but it's, he's talking about Banquo. Uh, it's after he's already killed Duncan. Don't and, thou shake your gory locks at me or? No, the, oh, that, that's great. Uh, but it's it's right it's it's like when he basically decides to kill Banquo. I actually recorded myself doing it in English last year. Um, uh, to be thus is nothing. That's the first line. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Um, and it's just to me when I worked on it um, in the first production that I did. It was a whole very strong concept of we were schoolgirls, and it was it was a lot of other stuff. But as a core, what I found first of all, I think it's a very kind of clear soliloquy like it just in the in the in the cadence in the in the rhythm of it in the words that he uses I think like a modern audience can hear it quite clearly um that even that first line to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus like it's just like so clear that he is in this place of like why am I not satisfied why am I still in paranoia and the way it, in which too I think <laughs> as a Scorpio I tend to get very <laughs> Uh, and the relation of being like, why does Banquo get to benefit from my sacrifice? Like it caters to like, you know, what I love about acting and theater is I get to go to those dark places, which is again, why I want to see more of these Kylo Ren great characters that I can play because I'm not that way in real life, but I'm like an inch away from it. You know, like we're all an inch away from being Macbeth. I mean, not an inch, maybe, maybe a foot, maybe a It'll foot. be even better in the original Klingon. I can imagine, because again, visceral, I, all those, that consonant action is going to be great. I love it. We've got four minutes left. You got anything else you'd like to, to, to add? Should have left you more time. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, well, I mean, this is just, I mean, it, this has been such an awesome conversation. I'm so thrilled that um, we got to have it together. And, and I, I really just want to celebrate you for all that you've contributed throughout the years in my Klingon journey and experience, like I, I truly would not feel as confident in, in my Klingon um, and this world had it not been from when we first met that January in the freezing cold um, through email exchanges and translations and um, just that. And then of course the whole uh, KLI community um, who I've been lucky to meet, you know, so many of you in person and I just hope I get to meet more of you um, in person when, when it's uh, safe to do so. Um, I'm trying to think again, love my shirt. <laughs> I wear it often. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just very moved and humbled um, to be, be a part of this community. And uh, I have so much respect for the tremendous amount of work that you do in really speaking the language. Cause like I said, I, you know, I'm as fluent as I can be, but uh, the discipline of really learning a language is, is extremely uh, difficult and to develop it and to hone it. I mean, I just have a deep amount of respect for that. Um, so thank you all for just doing what you're doing and, and being so fun. And then I, I suppose I, I felt of the things in Klingon, I could say, I felt it was only good to, to tie it all back into that first episode of remain Klingon, uh, which are, is more or less, um, as you said, we are Klingons, let it remain, which I love that that was, you know, an example of you expanding upon the English and making it fully embody uh, both uh, a phrase that we had heard before um, with Klingons and then making it its own. So I don't know, do you think 
I'll, I'll say it, you repeat it back. We'll like end on that. Does that seem good? All right. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, you know what? I'm gonna grab my little. Oh, the suspense. <laughs> my little Laurel from Starbase Indie. I don't know if anyone, I, I feel people are, people are, people are, I think in the audience who may have uh, created this and or um, witnessed it. So thanks again for this. She served me well, but ready? <clears throat> ready, Laurel? Klingon mach tach judge. Klingon mach tach judge. <laughs> Love it. I can only end this in the most Klingon way possible. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and.